thing on. Okay. I always get real nervous whenever I come up here to preach. But this morning, God reminded me of a, a man that was our pastor in Moscow. His name was Mike Brzezinski. He was a Vietnam era Green, Ber <coughs> Green Beret. So he's a pretty tough individual. But he had uh, passed one kidney stone after another, another, like 30 of them just in a row. He'd come to church and sit in the chair uh, by the pulpit and be just pale, just gray faced. And, uh, but he'd get up, start preaching, and just pff, color right, right back in his face again through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And what a preacher. He was probably one of the most spirit-filled people I ever met. <coughs> Sorry. With that, <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for these people that have gathered here today to hear your message. We thank you for every one of them that has so willingly chose to serve you, the singers and the musicians and 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 those that announce uh, do the announcements and the Sunday school teachers. Yes, bless them in a special way and bless me and, and calm my spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be reading most of this because I have a habit of uh, writing a whole bunch of stuff out then forgetting in the middle of the the sermon, what I wrote. So I'm going to start here. Last month, Vicki and I received the news of the Asbury revival. Our daughter, Sarah, the one in Mexico, emailed us on the 14th. The revival had already been happening for six days. When she uh, sent the email, I thought that she might have been talking about Asbury Theological Seminary. That's a very well-known seminary in Kentucky. So I got on the website, the Asbury website, and sure enough, it's Asbury University. Um, Asbury University started out in 1890 as Kentucky Holiness College. Then in um, 1891, they changed the name to Asbury College. And until 2010, it was Asbury College, and then became Asbury University. It's right across the street from Asbury Theological Seminary. And in fact, uh, Asbury Theological Seminary was started in 1923 by the president of Asbury College at that time, and he became the first president of Asbury Theological Seminary. So, the website describes Asbury as a private Christian university in Wilmore, Kentucky, with roots in the Wesleyan holiest, holiness movement. A little bit of history of the, uh, the holiness movement. Um, the movement actually started around 1843 when uh, two dozen Methodist Episcopal pastors left the church and withdrew from the, the Methodist Episcopal Church and founded the Wesleyan, uh, the Wesleyan Methodist Church. And uh, they um, founded that so they would be um, be free to preach holiness. The Wesleyan Methodist Church and the, the Wesleyan and the Methodist Episcopal Church had gone so far astray into humanism that they no longer preached any kind of gospel. So. The key word there in all that is holiness. Uh, and that's the title of our lesson today is Journey into Holiness. I took that title from uh, a lesson, our Sunday school lesson on March 12th. That was the title. We're studying the letters of Peter and, and Jude. That's going to be my theme today, holiness. Holiness. 
the discipline, which is the manual for the Wesleyan Church, talks about holiness in this way, then the holiness message. The discipline of the Wesleyan Church reveals that the message, reveals that message. The life of holiness continues through faith in the sanctifying blood of Christ and evidences itself by loving obedience to God's revealed will. And I wrote a little side note here. There's that old song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way but to be happy in Jesus, but to trust in one day. And that was. In 1860, the Free Methodist Church uh, followed suit. And this is from the 2015 Book of Discipline, the, the, method, the Free Methodist Doctrine. It says, in doctrine, Free Methodists believe beliefs are the standard beliefs of evangelical Arminian Protestantism with distinction, a distinctive emphasis on the scriptural teaching of entire sanctification as held by John Wesley. And that's right out of the, their, the book. In experience, Free Methodists stress the reality of an inner cleansing and power that attests the doctrine of, of entire sanctification sanctification both in the inward consciousness of believers and in their outward life. Um, many of you know uh, Walter Newenhouse that used to pastor this church here. We spent many many afternoons at his home uh, and every time we went there we discussed holiness and every time he preached he preached on holiness so the holiness movement has always had those oppose its message. That same skepticism and disbelief exists today. These three options were posted in a response to the news of the Asbury revival. I looked up the Asbury University and there's a side note <coughs> on the computer and this was written here. Was, this is uh, opinions by opposing views. The first one says the revival has its share of skeptics, many of whom argue that this is but another instance of embarrassing evangelical behavior. That's their words. Okay, number two, revivals are simply sites of emotional manipulation. Okay, number three, revivals like Asbury's lack moral seriousness. Okay. Okay. Before I uh, refute those opinions, if you could call them that, I'm going to tell you a story. My cousin Steve was a year younger than me, and he was a character. He did things sometimes that were weren't real smart. He wasn't a stupid person. He was pretty intelligent, but he was uh, impulsive, I guess you call it, or imprudent is another word. You've heard that old saying, look before you leap? Well, with Steve, the opposite was the norm. He had a ten tendency to leap before he looked, literally, at times. So, Anyway, Steve was uh, living with my sister and her family in Kellogg. He was working in the, the Bunker Hill zinc plant. And I was there at the time, too, because I think I may have been working there as well. I worked there for a while. But uh, he came from home from work one night, walked in through the kitchen, kitchen, and it was dark. So he walked into the living room and said, what's wrong with the, the, the light? And my sister said, the bulbs burned out. So he goes, flips the switch. No, no light. Comes back and said, well, it must be the switch. My sister said, no, it's the light bulb. Oh, it's got to be the switch. No. So I'll prove it to you. So he goes and gets a chair, stands up on the chair, unscrews the light bulb, looks at it. Oh, the light bulb's fine. Screw, or puts the bulb down. And they said, it's got to be the switch. And my sister said, my sister said no, it's the, just the bulb. He said, I'll prove it to you. He was endued with power, folks. 120 volts of it. And he was moved by it, too, from the chair down to the floor. 
when he got up, he was mumbling and couldn't understand what he was saying. We all knew what he was thinking. He was saying, "It's not the bulb. You're not the. It's not the switch. It's the bulb." So, of course, my sister said I was doubled over laughing at the time, and tears running out of my eyes. Moral of the story: That's it. Just because you think the power is not there doesn't mean it's not so. And it's never a good idea to use your finger as a voltmeter. So I believe the opinions, those opposing opinions, fit in that same category. They don't make any sense, none whatsoever. You talk about embarrassing behavior. What in the world is embarrassing about a, a revival meeting? Actions of the people. I'll tell you what's embarrassing is when a 10-year-old boy is standing there uh, tuning up his violin and his teacher comes along and moves the chair he's going to be sitting in without telling him and that young boy falls over flat on his back in the middle of the gymnasium with 300 people looking around. That's embarrassing. I know for, for a fact because that was me. And about 10 years later in that, seven, that same auditorium we were having a pep rally. That's at Sandpoint High School. And they were naming all the football players as they came out and run out in the middle of the, of the floor. Finally, they got around to the, the, the cheerleaders. And they'd name them all, and they'd come running out and do that. Well, the last one, they named her name. She came running out, screeched to a halt like that, but her hair didn't. Wig flew off, and it was just sailing across the floor. Looked like a short legged Pekingese, and she realized after a couple seconds of what had happened, so she took off running and snatched the wig up and out the door. That's embarrassing, folks. What in the world's embarrassing about a revival meeting? Have you ever been to a revival meeting? We've been to many. We used to have revival meetings at least once a year in the Nazarene church. They would schedule, set aside money for revivals. Revivals are needed. And that's a practice I, I wish they'd return to. What about emotional man manipulation? Man emotional manipulation. Every day, at least a dozen times on TV, you see pictures of uh, crippled children or or starving animals or, or whatnot. That's emotional manipulation. It's for a good cause, you bet. That's for a good cause, but still emotional manipulation. Why shouldn't uh, the Holy Spirit use our emotions to help us come back and live holy lives? And this third one is the, the one that really, really made me mad. It says, Revivals lack moral seriousness. How so? Revivals are to renew holding a desire to, to live a holy life. Something that Vicki showed me this uh, last week really got to me. This is last Thursday, Notre Dame University hosted an event titled and listen to this title, Queer Holiness, an Experiential Christian Anthropology. The guest speaker was Reverend Charles Bell, a gay deacon of the Church of England. He wrote the book, Queer Holiness, the Gift of the LGBTQI People to the Church. Well, I know what L is, and I know what G is, I know what B is, I know what T is and Q is, but I have no idea what the I is on that, unless it means indifference. So, I have a bunch of scriptures that I'm going to read here and some commentary on each one of these scriptures. Leviticus 19.2 You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's thought by many to be a command, but it's not. It is, but it isn't. The word you shall is, is you shall. That's called a future, indicative, emphatic. That means there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're going to be holy. And that's God's promise to people. And the commentary on that states, 
More than any Old Testament book, Leviticus summons its readers to live a holy life. All sacrifices go for naught if they do not remove, or do not produce a holy living. The word holy in one of its forms is used 152 times in, in Leviticus alone. It's, it's 830 times that word is used in the Old Testament and 268 times in the New Testament. So God wants us to be holy. That commentary continues, God does not ask his people to be something he is not. We cannot become God in his essence, but we can and are expected to share his character. That commentary was written by Dr. Victor Hamilton, professor of religion, Asbury College. That's what it's in there. Joshua 24, 15, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve <coughs> the Lord. The, and the commentary, the call to all out commitment is always intended for now. Dr. Gerald M Miller, Asbury College. Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That's, that's endued, literally means pressed into. If believers are to be filled with the Spirit, they must consciously choose to seek the Spirit in His sanctifying fullness. That's Dr. Robert R. Morris, Asbury College. Can we get an idea why Asbury... Uh, Asbury University might be the site of a, one of the major revivals of this, this uh, millennium. Asbury College or Asbury University has had nine, uh, nine revivals from 1905 to 2023. And one of them was a major, major revival that spread across the nation in 1970. And uh, Bob and I talked about it last week. Acts 2, 38 through 39. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And a commentary on that. The promised gift of spirit extended not only to Peter's hearers, but to everyone. If we have been called as followers of Christ, the promise is for us as well. That's Dr. George Turner, Asbury Theological Seminary. So back to Asbury again. And this final one is in Ezekiel. Now let me find it here. This is quite a long passage. Let me find it here. Okay. This is Ezekiel 24 through 27. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you unto your own land. Then I will sprinkle <coughs> clean water on you, and you, will, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then in verse 31, then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that you were not good and you will be and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your in, inequities and abominations. There's a bunch of commentary on that. On verse 25 where it says I will sprinkle clean water on you. This signifies both the blood of Christ sprinkled upon their conscience to to take away their guilt, and, and the grace of the Spirit sprinkled on the whole soul to purify it from all corrupt inclinations and dispositions. That was written by John Wesley. A new heart, verse 26, 
I will change the whole of your infected nature and give you new appetites and new passions, or at least the old ones purified and refined. That was Adam Clark, his commentator, was a, a disciple of, of Wesley. Verse 27, my spirit within you, I will put my spirit within you. This is the commentary on that. The new covenant has as its genius the change, not of the commandments, but of the human heart. It is by an infusion of God's spirit that humans are enabled not to sin. Verse 28, you shall be my people. This is another declaration of God's intention to renew the covenant, especially significant in, this, in the context of the promise of cleansing a new heart and a new spirit. Verse 31, when truly filled with God's spirit, we loathe all evil ways and deeds. That's metanoia, that's repentance, that change of mind. Those comment, comments were written by Dr. Joseph E. Colson, who is presently uh, teaching at Nazarene Th Theological Seminary. From 1995, he started it. From 91 to 95, he taught at uh, Roberts Wesleyan College. And from 1977 to 1991, he taught at Western Evangelical Seminary, where I went. Dr. Colson was my Hebrew professor, and he was also my faculty advisor. And he, I can tell you, he was a spiritual, he is a very spiritual man. First day of class, he stood up, was going to speak, and he started speaking in Hebrew. And he spoke for quite a while. He's fluent in Hebrew. He spent many years in studying in uh, Israel. All the doctoral statements, scripture, and expert commentary mean nothing to the non-believer. But personal experience creates proof and changes minds. Dickie and I attended a, a uh, camp meeting one summer. This is early 80s, I believe. And the speaker was a Nazarene missionary named Elmer Smeltenbaugh. He was the first Nazarene uh, missionary in Swaziland, South Africa, and spent many, many years there. Well, he spoke for two hours, and people kept saying, oh, tell us more, tell us more. And he kept saying, oh, I've got, I've got to leave, and uh, tell us more. So. He told all kinds of different stories, just one right after another, about the times that the Holy Spirit had guided him, protected him, and just comforted him. Uh, one story is about a snake. And they, uh, he and his son were walking through the, the jungle to a remote village to, for him to, to preach. And his son was right behind him, and he said, I smelled a snake. Well, I never smelled a snake. I smelled elk and deer before, I, that's for sure, but I never smelled a snake. Well, northern Idaho had, don't have, doesn't have snakes that are 12 foot long and as big around as your arm either. The snake they smelled was a black mamba that was hanging from a limb, and the head was right there. He's, he's thinking to himself, what do I do? What do I do? Black mambas strike and just keep striking until they can't move anymore. And he, uh, this thing will not only get me, kill me, it'll kill my son. He said, I'll grab it by the neck. Now, well, where's the neck on a snake? He said, well, at least if I hang on to it, my son will get away. He said, this thing's right here. He said, my friend is there. Snake drops to the ground and slithers off and he went on into the village. He's getting ready to retire. <clears throat> he and his wife were going to come back to the United States. His wife had a massive stroke. Was in the hospital in a deep, deep coma for days and days. And Smeldsenbaugh said he couldn't sleep that whole time. He'd just, just nod off and then be awake again to be praying for his wife. And this went on for a couple of weeks. But uh, finally, the doctor came in and, uh, and smelled the ball was about done in. 
And the doctor says, well, I'll, I'll watch her for a while. So he said, smelled and bust it. And my friend was there. And uh, he fell asleep. Yes. Yes, fell off to sleep. And the doctor's watching his wife. And, uh, and uh, the doctor's listening to her heavy labored breathing and thinking to himself, she won't be with us much longer. About that time, her eyes opened up. And the doctor's looking at her like, oh, he's shocked. This, he's done everything for this woman except signed her death certificate, and, and she's awake. So he says, how do you feel? She says, I'm thirsty. So he goes and gets her a glass of water, comes back, and he says, how do you feel? She says, well, if I could see, I'd see better if I had my glasses. It's like 100% healed. They came home, and his wife was still at home while he was preaching there at, at its final campground. But, and they played the song, Come, the <coughs> Come Thou Fount. And boy, he did. That whole, whole auditorium, just everywhere, it just, you could feel God's presence. People were testifying. One man I heard testify said that he grew up in the Nazarene church where they preach entire sanctification, he said he never experienced, he didn't really believe in it until that night. He was. And I wrote down here, and for the new Christian who has asked God for forgiveness th through Jesus and whose mind has been changed by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, but still he struggles to live a holy life. To that one I say, rejoice. You shall be holy. God will, will fill you with his spirit. And just as we are saved by faith, we can be sanctified by that same faith. And thank you for coming. That, this might be short, but it's, it's to the point. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that does fill this place. And Lord, we just ask that you would touch each and every one that is gathered here with that same spirit. Just bless us. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.